Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour. Wherever you are and however you are tuning in, we're so glad you're here. So with that, we'll open our study with hymn 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. We'll sing the first, second, and third verse. Our next song is hymn 298, uh, I Lay My Sins on Jesus. We'll sing the first, second, and third verse. special request, please visit us at our website at sexcentral.org. Click on the contact us link. Be sure to tell us where you're from um, and choose any song that is in our hymnal. We'll be singing them in the coming Sabbaths. Our last song comes from our new topical index of joy and peace. And that hymn is 463 Peace, Perfect Peace, a great way to open it. Um, and the thing about joy and peace is very interesting. I heard once um, that happiness is something that we get, that we receive kind of externally um, from external motivators, whereas joy can only be given and it comes from inside of us, from Jesus, yes? Um, and so I think it's interesting that our hymnal couples joy and peace uh, because we also know that peace 
the Lord gives it to us, and it's one that the world cannot give. Amen. So let's sing in our new uh, theme in our topical index, Joy and Peace, hymn 463. We'll sing three verses of peace, perfect peace. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your peace, a peace that only you can give, a peace that we cannot find in the world unless we should be drawn closer to you for that, for all of the blessings, not only your peace, but your joy um, and your precious gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for all of this, for your holy Sabbath day, for your, your word that we are soon to dive into in the book of Matthew. Um, please bless us. Bless Pastor Fred. In your loving name we pray. Amen. Our lesson study this morning will be brought to us by Pastor Fred Dana, our associate pastor at Sac Central Church. I want to welcome everybody to Central Study Hour. It's good to see you. And even though we can't see you online, we're glad you're with us. And um, looking forward to a good study today. This happens to be a lesson it has more in it than it's possible to cover in one session, uh, but we'll do our best. And um, uh, also, for those who are online or even here, if you would like to get a copy of this presentation, um, just make sure that you request a CD or a DVD, specify what you want. The offer is C21623, and you can call 916-457-6511 or email at csh at saccentral.org. So let's open our lesson to uh, the introduction. Uh, the title is Jesus in Jerusalem. Why he was there is the reason it even matters that he was there. Do you follow me? Why was he in Jerusalem? In our lesson in the beginning of the narrative, it quotes from Matthew 20, 27 to 28, Verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus was in Jerusalem because it was the whole purpose of his coming here to give his life a ransom for many. The narrative says, This self-denial, this self-abnegation will soon climax on a mystery that even angels desire to look into. Those were Peter's words from 1 Peter 1.12. And that is, of course, the cross. Now, I'd like you to go to Friday's lesson for a, a minute because something intrigued me on in Friday's lesson that goes well with the introduction. You remember reading about the lady that had been dead in an apartment in London for three years and nobody had known? You know, that, that's such a, a shocking thing that it became international news, according to the author. And, but the people in London were especially stunned because how could somebody in their city be dead for three years, and nobody even knew it or missed him. But the author goes on to make this point. Without the hope and promise of the gospel, 
we're all doomed to the same oblivion as that lady that was dead for three years and nobody knew. Our cemeteries all across the world are filled with people that have been completely forgotten. Nobody knows who they are except maybe a name on a stone. Millions and billions of people just as forgotten as that person dead for three years in the apartment. And like I said, without the hope of the gospel, they, you know, there would be no one to, to lament or even miss us or feel sorry. But because of the cross, because Jesus went to Jerusalem and faced it all, instead of a, eternal oblivion, we have the promise of eternal life. Now, down at the, at the lower part of um, Friday's lesson, question number one, uh, this is interesting. It kind of follows along with this. It says, think about just how final and powerful death is and how futile all human endeavors over the millennia have been to defeat it. You know, it says the best we can do to some degree is preserve our corpses. <laughs> you, you know, science fiction is filled with that kind of stuff, you know, trying to preserve the body so that when science catches up, they can bring you back and then you can keep living and have eternal life, that kind of stuff. But no matter how hard human beings have tried to defeat death, they just can't do it. And, uh, and so further down it says, it took something as intense and dramatic as the death and the resurrection of the Son of God to conquer death in your behalf and my behalf. There would be no hope otherwise, right? So the question here is, what should this tell us about how central the cross must be to all our hopes and to all that we believe? It just kind of puts it right in a nutshell, right? There is no hope without the cross. And this is why Jesus went to Jerusalem. This is why Jesus is in Jerusalem in Matthew 21 and 22 and so on. Going back to the introduction, the final paragraph in the narrative says, this, week le this week's lesson looks at some of the major events and teachings of Jesus as he came to Jerusalem. Not to be crowned an earthly king, as so many people had desired and hoped, but to be made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's from Paul's writing, 2 Corinthians 5.21. All right, let's go to Sunday. In Jeremiah's time, God's people, Judah, had been exiled to Babylon because of their idolatry and rebellion. Not too long ago, we had a whole quarter on Jeremiah. We went over this many times. Solomon's magnificent temple was destroyed and left in ruins along with the whole city of Jerusalem. And following their 70-year captivity in Babylon, Babylon's conquerors, the Medes and Persians, allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem, and, and now they're excited about rebuilding their temple. But as the narrative tells us, as the foundation was laid, those who remembered Solomon's magnificent temple realized that this second temple wasn't even going to be close to being as nice. And they wept out loud. Now, the people who remembered that had to be older people, right? So this was a case where the older folks were discouraging everybody else. I hope that doesn't happen too often. But that's what was happening here. But the, God sent some encouragement. The encouragement came from an old prophet named Haggai and a young prophet named Zechariah. So let's take a look. Uh, the narrative has the quotes from their writings, but you see about halfway down through the first section um, here, it says, Haggai said, This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. Now, I want to think about that phrase, what is desired by all nations. Who is the desire of all nations? Jesus. Yeah, the Messiah, the Deliverer, Jesus. You know, um, in the book Desire of Ages, right in the preface, there's an interesting explanation for how this book got the name. And you're seeing where the inspiration from it came. It says, In the hearts of all mankind, of whatever race or station in life, there are inexpressible longings for something they do not now possess. This longing 
is implanted in the very constitution of man by a merciful God that man may not be satisfied with his present conditions or attainments, whether bad or good or better. God desires that the human shall seek the best and find it to the eternal blessing of his soul. Now, the preface goes on to say that the devil perverts that longing and he tries to get man to take shortcuts, you know, for fulfillment. You know, whether it be fame or wealth or a life of ease or power or pleasure. The devil tries to get people to think they can fulfill that longing with all these substitutes. And, and it's the, the authors, the, by the way, it was the publishers that wrote this preface, that says, but it ends up leaving the soul as barren and unsatisfied as before. And it says, it is God's design that this longing of the human heart should lead to the one who alone is able to satisfy it, the desires of him, that it may lead to him the fullness and fulfillment of that desire. That fullness is found in Jesus the Christ, the Son of the eternal God. And then a little farther down, the publishers take it to Haggai here and it says, Haggai calls him the desire of all nations. And we may well call him the desire of all ages, even as he is the king of the ages. It is the purpose of this book to set forth Jesus Christ as the one in whom every longing may be satisfied. And this is what Haggai is talking about when he refers to the coming one as what is desired by all nations and that he will come and fill this house with glory. Uh, he continues, Haggai continues, says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house Shall, will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. So even though the temple they were building here wouldn't be as spectacular to the eyes as Solomon's temple had been, it would have greater glory because the desire of all nations would come to it Amen. and be in it. Well, uh, as a, the author says, things got even more hopeful when the young prophet Zacharias spoke. Here's what Zacharias says. It's, I'm reading right out of the quarterly. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 9.9. That must have been an exciting prophecy. See, when the Messiah came, he would come or he would make a grand entrance as king by riding into Jerusalem to the temple on the foal of a donkey. Well, let's go to the Bible now. Matthew 21. And um, I'm going to read part of, this, uh, part of this and someone else is going to... Who's going to read uh, uh, verses 6 to... You read 6 to 11. Okay, that's Karen. All right, we'll get to you in a minute. We're going to start with uh, verses 1 to 5. So let's read Matthew 21, 1 to 5. It says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. So the question is, which prophecy is Matthew indicating was about to come true? Yeah, all right, it was Zechariah's prophecy, the one we just read about the riding in like a king on a colt, but humble on a colt. All right, and now... Um, let's pick it up with verses 6 to 11. Karen, you, you, you got your mic, go ahead and read verses 6 to 11. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid on them their garments to which he sat. And most of the multitude spread their garments on the road and others were cutting branches from trees and spreading them on the road. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was steered, saying, Who is this? And the multitudes were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So the question is, why did the people get so excited and hail Jesus as the son of David? Because they recognized that prophecy was being fulfilled. Okay. They saw it as fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Thank you, Karen. Um, so what's interesting is it's not so clear here, but in Desire of Ages, it's clear who actually started the thought that way in the crowd. Listen to this. The disciples, with glad enthusiasm, spread their garments on the beast and seated their master upon it. Heretofore, Jesus had always traveled on foot, and the disciples had at first wondered why he would now choose to ride. But hope brightened in their hearts with the joyous thought that he was about to enter the capital, proclaim himself king, and assert his royal power. While on their errand, they communicated their glowing expectations to the friends of Jesus, and the excitement spread far and near, raising the expectations of the people to the highest pitch. So who started it? disciples. But you see, where I was just reading in Desire of Ages, page 570, what follows is here in the quarterly. Let's, let's, let's look at what else is said here. It says, Christ was following the Jewish custom for a royal entry. How many of you recall any stories in the Old Testament where when someone is proclaimed king, they rode on a donkey throughout the town? They're stories. Um, do you remember when um, David was near death and the one son was going to make himself king? He did that. And while, he, while actually he was having a party, and the one Solomon who was really supposed to be king, they brought him out and rode him through town on a donkey to show who really was. Okay? So that, that's, that is a custom in Jewish history. It says, The animal on which he rode was that ridden by the kings of Israel, and prophecy had foretold that thus the Messiah should come to his kingdom. No sooner was he seated upon the colt than a loud shout of triumph rent the air. Can you picture it? The multitude hailed him as Messiah, their king. They knew the prophecy. Jesus now accepted the homage which he had never before permitted. And the disciples received this as proof that their glad hopes were to be realized by seeing him established on the throne. In spite of everything he had said, the multitude were convinced that the hour of their emancipation was at hand. In imagination, they saw the Roman armies driven from Jerusalem and Israel once more an independent nation. So this raises a question. Why did Jesus allow this great procession? Why did he do it? You remember why he's in Jerusalem? Because he's going to the cross. How little they knew. Do you think, well, there's a question here. It says, what lessons might we take away for ourselves about how preconceived notions could distort truth? Do you think some things, not, some things might not be quite as we think in the end time fulfillment of prophecy? You think that's a possibility? You ever wonder what we might be misunderstanding? Because when you look back at history, there's always misunderstandings. Let's go to Monday's lesson. And uh, in, a, in a minute, we'll be reading from verses 12 to 17 of Matthew 21. All right, Pat has that. Okay. So we'll get to you in just a minute, Pat. Um, in Desire of Ages, page 575, you know, this is titled Jesus in the Temple. Um, I just want to share with you a couple of excerpts right here out of Desire of Ages about the temple. You see, when Jesus was coming in the triumphal entry and they stopped, it was, it was not too far from sundown, and they were looking at Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was bathed in the light. Um, the angle of the sun and everything made Jerusalem look very spectacular. But the temple was there right in the middle of it. And it says here, the temple had long been the pride and glory of the Jewish nation. And even the Romans prided themselves in its magnificence. It was considered one of the wonders of the world. The Romans consider it one of the wonders of the Roman Empire. All right? But there in the sun setting on the west, it's, she says here, its resplendent glory lighted up the pure white marble of the temple walls and sparkled on its gold cat pillars. And it caught the splendor 
of the setting sun shining as if with a glory borrowed from heaven. And they were looking at it with wonder because it was the pride of the nation. But you know, Israel's piety didn't measure up to the golden standards taught by the symbols in those sacred precincts. And for 1,400 years, God had patiently borne with rebellion and idolatry and had wooed his people. But ultimately, rebellion had run its course and Jesus himself would be there as their final chance. Well, in the narrative uh, toward the middle of the page, it talked about the corruption at the temple. It says here, by the time of Jesus, things had become so terribly perverted by the greed and the avarice of the priests, the ones who were supposed to make sure everything was holy, that in the eyes of the people, the sacredness of the sacrificial service had been in a great measure destroyed. So even the people don't see the holiness of it. They just see a building that's magnificent to be proud of and but they don't see the holiness because of what's going on there. All right, so let's um, read Matthew 21, 12 to 17. And Pat, I think you're ready to go. All right. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written... My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Okay, so again, the question, why why did Jesus cleanse the temple? Why did he see it as necessary? Because when he got there, all of the people that were there had set it up like a marketplace. They were selling things, Mm -hmm. and they were probably overcharging people for whatever they were selling. And he got very unhappy, and he wanted his house to be a house of prayer, not a market. Okay. And when you said probably overcharging, the words that give you the idea that that's true was he called it a den of thieves, right? So pretty serious stuff. Um, In Desire of Ages on 289, it says... There was the constant sound of angry altercation between traffickers fighting over prices. And so completely were they controlled by their greed of gain that in the sight of God they were no better than thieves. In the place of humble repentance of sin, they had multiplied the sacrifices of beasts as if God could be honored by a heartless service. It's like, you know, you can sin all you want. If you got money, just keep doing sacrifices. It's okay. Uh, the very symbols pointing to the Lamb of God, they had made a means of getting gain. It's sad, isn't it? Well, in the teacher's helps, we have um, some, something that got me thinking. And I want to ask you this question. How can Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple become a personal spiritual experience for you and me? So while you're thinking about that, maybe if I break it down and ask this question first, personally for each of us, where does Christ want to enter? He wants to enter our hearts, right? So the triumphal entry into Jerusalem should be a message to us. He wants to enter our hearts. And what does Jesus want to do with our lives and with our hearts? He wants to cleanse our lives and hearts from sin. Isn't that interesting? Um, So Christ entering our hearts brings spiritual victories accompanied by spiritual cleansing and personal accountability. This 
this cleansing and accountability may initially be unwelcome and even, even painful. Now, why would I say that? Cleansing and accountability is painful. Why? It, it goes against our natural grain. See, a human heart naturally resists. And Christ's cleansing and accountability crosses our natural inclination. And so it can be painful. But nevertheless, whenever this process is completed, believers rejoice over the transformation that is accomplished in their lives. It can be painful, but the rejoicing is the end result. Now, before we leave the cleansing of the temple, there's just one little uh, kind of obvious aspect we need to just uh, bring to your mind. Uh, Paul talks about our bodies as a temple of God, right? Um, you know, so what lessons might believers personally learn from Christ's cleansing of the Jerusalem temple? Is cleansing only spiritual? No, we have a body to take care of. God gave us a body, and he wants us to keep it as healthy as we can. And, you know, and the Spirit's, the spirit's connection with us is only through the nerves of the brain. And if we have a healthy body and a clear-thinking mind, then God could do his spiritual work in us easier. And so having a healthy body is part of God's plan to cleanse us. Anyway, that's all I'll say on that. But it's basically, cleansing is physical as well as spiritual. Does that make sense? All right. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson. Just to kind of... Um, little introduction to this passage. The disciples had always seen Jesus healing, restoring, blessing. Everything they'd seen Jesus do was just positive and helpful. And now we're going to read about something Jesus did that astonished them. It seems so out of character. Totally unlike Jesus. This is from Matthew 21, 18 to 22. And if you're ready to go, go ahead and read it, Richard. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city... He was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Okay, so this tree looked like it would be a good tree for fruit. Yet it had none and it was a great disappointment. Uh, Richard, what do you think this tree represents? Well, I think the tree represented the heart condition of the people of the nation of Judah. As a tree had beautiful green shiny leaves, so the nation of Judah had a marvelous temple. They had wonderful services in the temple. They had the truth of God's word. But as the fig tree had no fruit on it, the nation of Judah had no fruit. There was no love. There were confusion. They were so caught up in their ceremonies that they had no relationship with Christ and no desire really to get a relationship with Christ. Okay, very well put. So that raises the question, why does Jesus, well, maybe I should put it this way, how does Jesus cursing the fig, fig tree relate also to the cleansing of the temple? I think in both cases, uh, Christ is passing judgment. In the judgment in the temple, he's judging those who have or have not a relationship with him, and he's scratching names out of the book of life. I think with the fig tree, it represented a judgment on a nation who was in rebellion, and had no desire to know him or have a relationship with him. Okay, so they're both kind of a judgment, right? Uh, pretty serious thing. So the question is, uh, what actually is Jesus looking for? Now, your answer implied by saying what they were missing, um, but I, I would like to share with you uh, a comment from Desire of Ages um, on what Jesus was looking for. Um, says he longed to see in them. See, they had this obstinate rebellion, right? Just obstinate, persistent stubbornness. And he, but he longed to see in them 
self-sacrifice and compassion, zeal for God and a yearning of soul for, for the salvation of their fellow men. It says, but love to God and man was eclipsed by pride and self-sufficiency. They brought ruin upon themselves by refusing to minister to others. The treasures of truth which God had committed to them, they did not give to the world. Now, this is a really solemn thing, um, and I'm going to continue on the next page because she's, she, the author has taken the point that it wasn't so much the bad things they did as what they didn't do that God asked them to do, and that was to love the world and share the truth with the world. So she goes on, this warning is for all time. Christ's act in cursing the tree which his own power had created stands as a warning to all churches and to all Christians. No one can live the law of God without ministering to others. But there are many who do not live out Christ's merciful, unselfish life. Some who think themselves excellent Christians do not understand what constitutes service for God. They plan and study to please themselves. They act only in reference to self. Not for others, but for themselves do they minister. It says, God created them to live in a world where unselfish service may be performed. He designed them to help their fellow men in every possible way, but self is so large they cannot see anything else. They are not in touch with humanity. Thus, those, thus, oh, those who thus live for self are like the fig tree which made every pretension but was fruitless. They observe the forms of worship but without repentance or faith. In profession, they honor the law of God but obedience is lacking. They say but do not. In the sentence pronounced on the fig tree, Christ demonstrates how hateful in his eyes is this vain pretense. He declares that the open sinner is less guilty Then is he who professes to serve God, but bears no fruit to his glory. You see, the leaves on that fig tree represent all the good things about the outward religion. The leaves on the fig tree represent going to church. But the fruit that's missing is the passion for the lost. And I wonder... If the fig tree represented us today, how Christ would respond. We don't have to wonder. It does. Pretty serious stuff. I, I just, when I saw that, I just had to share it. I just hope you don't mind. Well, uh, something else uh, the author brings out, or whoever wrote the question at the bottom of Tuesday's page, says the question sooner or later... Uh, No question, sooner or later, people totally reject God's mercy and grace. I thought that uh, they probably should have qualified that because not everybody does, right? Some people accept it. So I I, I just added something. No question, sooner or later, multitudes of people totally reject God's mercy and grace. But then there's this question. Why, though, is it so important that we leave those kinds of judgments to God and never make them ourselves, either about others or even our own selves? Yeah. Yeah. Because we'd make terrible mistakes. We don't know. We don't know hearts. If human beings were allowed to make judgments, they'd constantly be wrong. Only God's always right. You know, so he hasn't given us that job. And so we have to keep that in mind. Now, but we don't want to be like the fruitless fig tree, right? So what actions might we undertake to ensure that we don't have a fruitless experience? All right, Roy says we have to share the gospel. The context of those those Desire Desire of Ages passage was about ministering, sharing the truth, right? But that might mean giving somebody clothes who needs warmer clothes on a cold night that's out on the street. It might mean giving food. It might mean sharing the gospel. Um, Always hope that opportunity is there. But um, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Visiting the sick, visiting them in prison giving food, drink, yeah. Um, And so to ensure we don't have a fruitless experience, there should be action in our life, right? But we can't get the right action if we don't get the right spirit. And that is a heart of faith and believing, being able to admit our sins so that Christ 
can give us real deep repentance, and then praying for his help, that's action, and reading the Bible so that we become more in tune with God through that. But ultimately, the action needs to be an action of service, right? And whatever is required at the moment. All right, let's go to a Wednesday's lesson. Uh, we have uh, Matthew 21, 33. I'm going to highlight um, 33 down to 39. This is the, uh, the parable of the wicked husbandman. Um, this, is, this parable is one of the most astounding ones to me, uh, especially the way it turns out uh, at the end and, and how the Pharisees actually pronounce their own judgment. This is just a masterpiece of Christ's intelligence, but we're also going to see that it's a masterpiece of his compassion. But at this parable, we have somebody who owns land. King James calls him a householder. Other translations say landowner. But it's, a, it's a, uh, someone who owns a land, and he has a vineyard, and he hedged, put a hedge around it and um, built a tower, and then he hired husbandmen or sharecroppers to, you know, make sure a nice crop was raised. Um, interesting, the lesson didn't go into it in that much depth, but everything that I just said represents something. Um, and um, the vineyard represents the Jewish nation. The householder or the landowner, of course, represents God. So you have God, he sets up his vineyard. That's his chosen people. He hedged it about. What did he hedge it about with? What's the hedge? It's the law of God. And the funny thing about the law of God, you can look at it as a wall that keeps you in, like a prisoner, or you can look at it as a hedge or wall that protects you from what's outside. The law, when rightly understood, is a hedge of protection. And so here it's a hedge. And then it says he built a tower. The tower represents the temple. And then he put people in charge of it, the husbandmen, which represents the Jewish people. And then it says that when it was time that there should be a harvest and the landowner should get his rightful share, he sent servants to the husbandman to get his rightful share. And the Bible says they beat one, killed another, uh, stoned another. And then he sent more servants and they did more abuse and killed more of them. What do the servants represent? They represent the prophets God sent to Israel to keep... Uh, warning them of, and calling them to, back to God and to repentance. And then in the story, this landowner thinks after all these servants have been killed, he can send his son and that'll be fine. He should have been, right? Because he should have had more respect than even a prophet. But he was treated the same way. Verse 39 says, they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. All right? So we have our highlights there. And now let's read 40 and 41. Verse 40, Jesus is telling this story, and then he says in verse 40, When the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And then the Pharisees give this answer, verse 41. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which will render him the fruits in their seasons. In their seasons. What did they just do? What just happened here? Yeah, they pronounced their own condemnation. And Desire of Ages on 596 says that when they started answering, that thought wasn't in their mind, but by the time their words were done, they realized what they had just done. What I love is Desire of Ages says right after that, Jesus looked at them with pity, and then he said the words that are in verse 42 and 43. Remember, he's looking with pity. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting Psalm 118. And then he says this in verse 43. He's repeating their own judgment. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So let's talk about verse 43 and then go back to 44 and 42. 
See, the Jews, according to this verse, 43, the Jews would lose the privilege of having the kingdom of God to share with the world. I mean, they didn't share it anyway. They rebelled. They cut it off from the world. So who would the kingdom be given to? It says here it would be given to a nation that was more worthy. Not all Gentiles got it. What qualified a person to receive the kingdom? The acceptance of Jesus. And so those who accepted Christ became spiritual Israel, the church. Okay? Now, verse 42, this one about the, the, the cornerstone that had been rejected and then became head of the corner. As I mentioned, this is a quotation from Psalms 118, 22, and 23. And this was a reference to a real event in the history of Israel. When the first temple was built, uh, you know, no tools or the sound of hammering or anything could happen at the temple site. And all that was being done out in the quarries and stuff, and they would send the stones in. And this, this big stone came uh, to be used in the foundation. It was a stone of unusual size and peculiar shape that had been brought. And the workers couldn't see that it would fit anywhere, and they just thought this big stone was in the way, and they just eventually didn't use it, uh, and it long remained a rejected stone. And our quarterly quotes from Desire of Ages 598, where it says that uh, when they got to where they needed a special stone for the corner, the stone that would bear the most weight, the stone that would be the most critical to holding up the wall, they were searching for just the right stone, and they couldn't find it. All along, the rejected one was right there in their midst. And, and they were hunting and saying, can't you get us the stone like this and like this, whatever. And then finally someone said, well, what about this one? And they said, oh. It had been there so long not being seen that it was almost like invisible, even though it was huge. And they said, okay, let's give it a try. And so when they put the stone in place, it was an exact fit. The long rejected cornerstone was the perfect stone at the right time in the right place. I love that because, I mean, we know who that stone represents. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, I just want to ask you this question. What encouragement might believers derive from the circumstances that th that cornerstone, representing Christ, was initially rejected before being recognized as the indispensable rock? What encouragement is there in that story? Do you have friends and relatives that have not accepted Jesus? Is he like the rejected cornerstone as far as their life is concerned? Yeah. But was the stone always rejected? No. So you pray that they will accept the chief cornerstone into their life. And having it rejected in the past doesn't mean it always has to be that way. Right? I love that about that story. But out at the bottom of Wednesday's lesson... Um, it says, uh, read Matthew 21, 44. Yeah, we didn't get to that. This is about the stone. It says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Wow. Two different ways of relating to the rock are represented. One is falling on the rock and being broken, and the other is the rock falls on you and you get crushed. What's the crucial difference? Uh... Desire of Ages has some really very clear stuff on this. I just want to share with you something on, you know, this is falling on the rock and being broken. That's one of the things that we're all supposed to do, fall on the rock and being broken. But people, I remember when I was a kid, I said, I don't get that. You know, if you fall on a rock, you know, you might hurt your knee, but, you know, i just trying to grasp that. It was, it was like dark speech to me, you know. And so... Ellen White has a neat explanation of it. What does it mean to fall on the rock and be broken? Is that just one of those Christian cliches that doesn't mean anything? Not hardly. It says, those who believe, to those who believe Christ is the sure foundation, these are they who fall upon the rock and are broken. Submission to Christ and faith in him are here represented. To fall upon the rock and be broken is to give up our self-righteousness and go to Christ with the humility of a child repenting of our transgressions and believing in his forgiving love. And so also it is by faith and obedience that we build on Christ as our foundation, build on Christ, the solid rock, right? I, I love that. But unfortunately, there's another side. That's, that's the good part, to fall on the rock and be broken. But then there's the part about the rock falling on you. 
Uh, and on the next page in Desire of Ages, this is pretty solemn, but it says, and on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. The people who rejected Christ were soon to see their city and their nation destroyed. Their glory would be broken and scattered as the dust before the wind. And what was it that destroyed the Jews? It was the rock which, had they built upon it, would have been their security. It was the goodness of God despised, the righteousness spurned, the mercy slighted. Men set themselves in opposition to God, and all that would have been their salvation was turned to their destruction. All that God ordained unto life, they found to be unto death. In the Jews' crucifixion of Christ was involved the destruction of Jerusalem. The blood shed upon Calvary was the weight that sank them to ruin for this world and for the world to come. So it will be in the great final day when judgment shall fall upon the rejecters of God's grace. Grace, Christ, their rock of offense, will then appear to them as an avenging mountain. The glory of his countenance, which is to the righteous life, will be to the wicked a consuming fire. Because of love rejected, grace despised, the sinner will be destroyed. Well, like I said before, the fact that a rejected stone was finally accepted gives us hope for us, for relatives, for everybody. Now, there's a question in the teacher's helps that I thought was really worth looking at. This is how it goes. It says, what reassurance might disciples find in knowing that the temple cornerstone was the only stone that fit and was capable of bearing enormous weight? And then it asks this question, how does Christ uniquely fit our needs? Will Christ fit into our life perfectly? Amen. Why can Christ alone uphold our emotional and physical baggage? Each of us have our own baggage. Things we're trying to deal with for nonsense we went through different times in our lives that affect our attitudes, that sometimes make us hopeless, sometimes make us angry. The chief cornerstone is a perfect fit for you and for me. He can carry the weight of all the baggage of everybody in this room, all the baggage of everybody in the world, no matter how severe and how damaging. He can bear that weight. He's a perfect fit. I love that. Well, let's go to Thursday's lesson. Uh, Thursday's lesson, uh, it's about the wedding feast, the wedding garment. And um, I'd like to highlight, it's from the first 14 verses of Matthew 22. Let's just sum it up real quick here. I'm almost out of time, so good chance to just summarize real fast. Um, it says, the kingdom of heaven, verse 2, is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And they bid all these people, and they didn't come. And, and then they sent them out again to invite him again and tell him everything's ready, just come. And the second time, the people that were invited were annoyed and because they weren't being left alone. And so it says they, they slew the messengers that uh, the king had sent. Verse 7 says the king was really angry, and so he sent an army to go get those people and destroy them in their city. And then he told his servants to go find the people in the highways and byways. Find the poor people. Find the homeless people. And, and bring them. Verse 9 says, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. And verse 10 says they gathered together all that they could find, both bad and good. They weren't even worried about whether they were good people or bad people. They said, you're invited, come. And, and it says, and the wedding was furnished. And the guests. The wedding provided everything. Verse 11 says the king came in and he saw someone who wasn't wearing a wedding garment. Now, if everything was furnished, that means these were handed out. And this guy got in somehow without getting the, the clothes that he was supposed to wear. And the king asked him why he didn't have a wedding garment, and the guy can't give an answer. So the king has him cast out. And Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. What is the meaning of the, of the wedding garment? That was a question near the bottom of the page. What does the wedding garment represent? All right. The wedding garment represents... The verse to look up, Revelation 19.8, was the righteousness of the saints. And of course, the righteousness of the saints can only come from Jesus. Um, but, so what does this parable teach us 
about salvation by faith. Did anybody make their own wedding garment, bring it in? No. We can't make our own righteousness. It was a gift, right? The wedding garments were a gift provided by the king. Down at the bottom of the page, it says, the garment represents the righteousness of Christ, a righteousness that is revealed in the life and acts of the saints. The man without the garment represented professed Christians who claim the privileges of grace and salvation, but haven't let the gospel transform their lives and characters. At a great cost, every provision has been made for those who heed the invitation. As this parable then shows, there's more to entering the kingdom of God than merely showing up at the door. You know, just going to church isn't going to do it, right? In the teacher's helps, there was a question. We won't have time to discuss it, but I want to leave this with you because it's a pretty solemn question. How can believers know that they have not merely accepted Christ's invitation but are certainly clothed with Christ's righteousness? See, this parable makes a difference. That man accepted the invitation to come to the wedding feast. You would think if you accepted the invitation, everything would work out. When we accept the invitation, is that all there is? How can we be sure to be clothed with Christ's righteousness? Is this important? This determined whether the man was allowed to stay in or he was cast out. This eternal, determined eternal life or eternal death. It's really important. And we should not rest until we're sure. Right? Well, thank you so much for uh, being a a good congregation, participating. Roy always answers up here, even though I can't stop and put the camera, we can't put the camera on him, but he's always there with me. Um, But before we go off, I just want to remind that uh, you can get the CD or the DVD. It's offer number C21623. You can call 916-457-6511 or email uh, csh at sackcentral.org. Make sure you say whether you want a CD or DVD. And I also have to say this. If you call in and leave a message, leave your address and a phone number. Because if you call and say, I want off or whatever, you know, and you don't say who you are or give us a way of contacting you, we can't get it to you, okay? So please do that and help us out.